Take us back in time, Don. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? I'm a book reader, obviously. I love, I mean, when e-books came along, I was like, yes. <laughs> you know, when you're a tour bus, you're in your bunks. Yeah, like, I can imagine. You're like, a bam, you're like in a coffin, right? Right. And you got nine guys snoring and farting. But it was great to put my headphones on when e-books came out and I could just lay in my bunk and the guy you know, narrates the book and you get some good people that do it and you get some people that suck, but I was an ebook reader. Yeah. Gotcha. So when you were growing up and you think back to, you know, formative films and TV shows that you grew up on, what comes to mind? American Bandstand. Oh, come on. Who didn't watch American Bandstand right. before MTV? And all. that was the only show that had everybody from everybody. I mean, everybody was on American Bandstand. Toward the end, you know, we got to be on American Bandstand. And Dick Clark was an icon, of course, and he did the New Year's Eve uh, drop the ball every Times Square. And But uh, I remember the show we did was with Gladys Knight and the Pips. Interesting, yeah. like Dick yeah, Doc nice. and Gladys Knight. Yeah. <laughs> and we were only supposed to do one show, song, you know, lip syncing. And I was like, man, this is so awesome. Like, you know, here I was 10 years old watching American Bandstand, watching the monkeys or Paul Brewer and the Raiders. And now I'm on it, millions of people. And uh, Mick said, you know, what was the, one of the greatest things that ever happened to you? And Mick said, meeting Gladys Knight and the Pips backstage. Man, he got the biggest smile on his face. We we're only supposed to do one song. We went to commercial. And Dick Clark, uh sister, came back and said, he said, you can do another song. And I went, really? Two? So we did. And you can look it up on YouTube. We did Alone Again and Lucky, I think. So that was really cool to him. I really, he was a great guy. What year was that? Fuck. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> a long time ago. Huh? <laughs> 86, 87. Gotcha. You know, it, it waned. And then they had the other show that was competing. It was more like uh, called Soul Train. Yeah. And uh, so it was very surreal to be a child watching American Bandstand. And then all of a sudden we're on it. So that was really cool, man. And, you know, he had like 4 million people watch that show. This was before MTV. Yeah. So, so that really, and I, our record sales like shot up the charts and, and it was really cool. And when Mick said, I love meeting last night in the pips, we'd been on there a million times. Dick got that big smile and he's like, I'm going to let Doc and do two songs. <laughs> that was great. And then unfortunately he asked George, what was the worst thing that's ever happened to you on tour? And, and George said, playing Detroit. And I'm like, oh shit, that's where Dick Clark came from. <laughs> you know like his start his career and we're all like no 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 you don't mean that you know we're no 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 because george has social tourettes and we're like, no, no he just means that you know he was sick on that show and it was really horrible and he had food boy we're just and even dick dick was you know like jumping in and we're like no he didn't mean like we hate detroit you don't want to piss off a couple hundred thousand people in that town right we try to do damage control you should google it sometime it's it's hilarious how Dick Clark went, what? I'm going to well, check it out. He hadn't done his homework that Dick Clark started in Detroit. <laughs> so, and he's telling him, what's the worst thing going to happen to you? Playing Detroit. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but that was George. Yeah. So, Don, what about your parents? Were either of them musically inclined? Is that where you think you got it from? The interest? Yeah. But, I mean, my father was a jazz musician. Mm. A trombone and a singer. He did the classics, like the 40s music, like Benny Goodman. and I can't remember the other guy's name right now. Glenn Miller. You know, jazz, classic. And uh, he had an orchestra, the Jerry Dawkins Orchestra, for till he played, till he was 80. Wow. And then he, I went to see him a couple of times just for fun, and he'd have to sit down on the stool because he was getting old. And uh, it's funny, he said a couple of some couple times people showed up at his show and so I thought Dawkins was playing because it said Jerry Dawkins. They, they went to the show anyway. And there's all these like 75-year-old people, you know, dancing to Glenn Miller. 
that was kind of hilarious. And uh, I actually played with my father. Uh, he uh, played an army base when I was like 12. It was probably one of the first shows I ever did. But all the officers were having, you know, a dance at the base and they had a lot of kids and they wanted some rock and roll. And my dad took me out there and bring your guitar and you can play a couple of rock songs for their kids. So I did. One of the first shows I ever did, I was probably 12 or 13. That was kind of cool. But my dad played jazz his whole life. My mother was a pianist on her side of the family. My grandmother was a pianist. My daughter is a classical trained pianist. So it's genetics, you know? Wow. So my son just... didn't get it. You know, I, I gave him both guitars and my son didn't grab it. He wanted to learn. I, my fault. I didn't give him a lot of lessons because I was on the road all the time. But Tyler was just, my son was just into planes, you know? And that's why he's a pilot. He flies the 767. That's the biggest plane they make. Wow. Uh, is, uh... Yeah. It's a big ass plane. He flies to Europe and Transcon. And now what about yourself, Don? Did was it the voice first, or did you gravitate towards an instrument initially? Well, I first played drums. I first played drums. What grade was that? Uh, fifth, sixth grade. The first show I said, I guess I could say I ever played was uh, at the end of the year, my sixth grade, I think. The, everybody had to do a project and the teacher said you if you want to you know, I had a guy I play guitar with and a guy played drums and we played in the classroom and for the last day of the year and I played Gloria and Louie Louie <laughs> that's about all I knew you know because anybody can learn Louie Louie in two seconds da 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 <laughs> one finger da 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 and the cool thing about that song is, you know, the government got involved and spent millions of dollars trying to ban it because they thought that the lyrics were pornography. And, you know, you, you you don't even know what he's saying. You know, he was from the Caribbean and he was talking in Caribbean slang. And all you all you know, remember is Louie, Louie, oh, baby, we got to go. And he goes, I'm sad, all right, I see I'm from, well, I'm like, I'm like. What the fuck is he saying? And the government literally tried to ban it and spent a shitload of money trying to decipher what he was singing. <laughs> like millions, typical government shit. Right. Get it off the radio. This is a, he's talking about sex or something bad. And, and the joke was, you no, know, the guy's from the Caribbean. He was singing Caribbean slang. And it took like 10, 15 years you know, they finally said, look, it's just, I'm from the Caribbean. <laughs> that was kind of funny, though. That's all I remembered. Right. I did the same thing. I went, Louie, Louie, oh, baby, you know, we got to go. And I had, oh, huh, or chata, okay, come down. Babe, I'm all around. I mean, I'm just mumbling, you know. <laughs> you did. But that was kind of funny. And I remember the government tried to ban it from the radio, which made it obviously a bigger hit. Right. Well, uh, the OG uh, uh, band uh, well, I was Cop Killer or one of those and Tipper Gore got in there and said you know you're, we don't like your lyrics I don't know if you were old enough to yeah, remember yeah I'm trying to think I'm just trying to think of the name of the band I don't know what you're talking about it's Ice-T I can't remember the name of the Ice -Tea. band Ice-T yeah and they're trying to and she wanted to you know we're going to pass a law that when you put a record out we're going to Review your lyrics and make sure they're appropriate for the radio. Really? <laughs> uh, have you read the Constitution? Freedom of speech? But that was a big to-do. But, you know, I don't think that band would have taken off if all the hubbub about their lyrics. I don't think it was Cop Killer. It was one of those other ones. But the bottom line is Kipper Dor Gore tried to, you know, push them down and they just got bigger. Ended up being great publicity. And remember, they put the stickers said parental advisory, you know, under 16. I'm like, and they're probably going, thank you, Tipper. You just, <laughs> you just made our record sell four million copies. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, we did the video of uh, the hunter. And one of the scenes, Jeff Pilson was running through the forest. These people were chasing him with torches like Frankenstein. 
and they cut he's in a cage and and the cage on the side said pmrc you know parental something da, 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 da. but that stupid she was such she was like white bread on toast and yeah. she really thought she could because her husband who he was oh i'll just get my husband to pass a law that all musicians you know have to be you know censored and thank god uh d snyder you know yeah, I was about went. to say that's around the same time as the whole Twisted Sister situation. Yep. And D went there and they're thinking, you know, we're going to tear him apart. But D is a smart guy and he talked very eloquently and he said, look, you know, I write what I write and I don't think about the government censoring my lyrics. Right. So, you know, D went to Congress and put the kibosh on that and God bless him for that. But strange times in that late 80s when <laughs> yeah. the government's... Well, I'm going to send my docking record back to the attack. And you got to send us all your lyrics to Tipper and and her five MILF girlfriends, <laughs> you know, multimillionaires that have senators and congressmen. And we'll 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 decide what you can sing and what you can't. What a bunch of bullshit. So when do you start to take music seriously as a youngster? Starting your first bands and maybe think, hey, I can do this as a career. Honestly. Without exaggerating, I never thought about it as being a career. I just like playing. You know, like my friends would get together. I had many, many drummers and different bass players and versions of Air Dawkin. Before that, we were called Airborne. And then some band got a record deal called Airborne, so we had to change the name. And I went, shit. We'll just call it Dawkin for the time being until I can come up with a name. But, you know... I remember thinking we were play the club scene with Van Halen, Quiet Riot and all that. And we were always the support band. And honestly, my, my dream was like, maybe we could get a big enough fan base someday. We could headline the whiskey, mm. which holds a whopping 650 people. That was my goal. But I assume, you know, I'd go to college and get a life. And, you know, I was a cook. My uncle was a famous chef and he was, I was a sous chef. And I just figured I, you know, I move on. And playing music was just for fun. I didn't have these grandiose visions of me being a rock star. I, I did. I really didn't. You know, I was just great. I just loved playing because when you're on stage, it's a spiritual rush. Yeah. And that was, it, you know. But I, I always say, if I ever write a book, it'll say famous by luck, <laughs> you know, or famous by accident. Right. Just the right time, right place, right person. But I didn't have that drive that most of my peers did to, we're going to make it and we're going to be famous. We're going to be the Rolling Stones. And I didn't have that. I was just happy to go out on the weekends, had a job, work nine to five, and we go out and play the whiskey or the Starwood or Troubadour. And we were just happy to play. Well, this is something I like to ask everybody, Don, before we get too far away from your childhood. Uh, what scared you as a kid? Nothing. That's that's good. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, I was pretty, you know, I wasn't worried about anything. When I got into high school, it got a little sketchy. So I went to Venice High. And uh, that was right when the Crips and the Bloods and B-13. So this the school got segregated. There'd be the Crips over there, B-13, the Hispanics, and then you had the Bloods. Depending if you wore a blue bandana or a red bandana. And I lived in Venice. So... You know, when I'd walk to school, it was like, wow, whopping half a mile. You know, they try to jump you and give me your lunch money. And I walk with my little brother who was like a wrestler. He was buffed. My little brother, he was like in eighth grade. And he goes, screw you. I'm not giving you my lunch money. And we get in fights. Mm. And they were chicken shit. You know, it was always three against one or two. Right. And I finally had enough, you know, and that's. It was interesting that right in the corner of Venice High School, they opened up a Taekwondo studio. So I started taking Taekwondo. And I studied for 20 years, Taekwondo. Because wow. I was like, I'm, I'm done. You know, you're not taking my shit. And now I drive by that high school. It's surrounded by chain link fence. And I thought, what a shame. When I went to high school, you could walk on campus, walk off. But, you know, I got it. They didn't know if you're a gang banger or a student. Right. So they finally surrounded the school like a prison with chain link. So different times, man, different times. Indeed. Um, 
So when did you meet? What was the first your first meeting with George Lynch? What Lynch? What was your first impressions of each other? Well, I didn't know him. I just knew that we had a really good band called The Boys while Mick was in the band. And they had a singer that kind of looked like David Lee, long blonde hair and gregarious. And, and you know, I could see that George was a shredder. And and then, you know, the next year, Van Halen got signed and everything took off. Then all these bands in the Midwest were coming to Hollywood thinking they'll get a record deal. Didn't happen. Nobody got a record deal. Because the new wave thing came. It was Blondie and Devo and New York punk. And all of a sudden, they weren't booking rock bands anymore. I mean, everybody talks about the whiskey, the whiskey, the whiskey, and the trooper. I go, dude, there was like 15 clubs in L.A. You could drive to the Valley and play the Rock Corporation. You could go over here and play Westwood. You know, there was tons of clubs. You could actually pay your rent if you just kept playing different clubs every weekend. And uh, I remember seeing Lynch and, uh, and the boys and Mick was an amazing drummer. And then I met people that owned a club in Hamburg. And they said, you're playing hard rock, and which was, wasn't popular right then. 78. Van Halen took off, got their record deal, came superstars. And I got an offer to go to Germany. And this club owner, uh, his name, uh, Michael Boyens, owned this big club in Hamburg. And he said, you should come to Germany because, you know, all the bands you like and the music you play is very popular in Europe. Saxon, Judas Priest, uh, band that Mickey was in before Doc and Black Diamond. Or, um, there's a lot of great bands that I liked. I always liked the European music. Mm. You know, nobody knew about Judas Priest or Saxon. Even the Scorpions hadn't made it in America. So I went to Germany. He said, look, I'm in a band. Come over, you buy the plane ticket, sleep in my house. I got drums, I got an amp, I got this and that. So me and Juan Crucier, before he joined Rat, we all went to Germany. I'd never been out of the country. <laughs> Didn't speak the language. And we just went to Germany and basically played the same thing the Beatles did. People don't realize the Beatles, you know, they just didn't blow out of England, you know, the at the cavern. They went to Germany and they played all the clubs in Hamburg, which is where all the prostitutes are. <laughs> so we basically did, we call it the Beatles run, the top 10, the Chicago club, star club. These were all the clubs that the Beatles played before they blew out. So we did the same thing, played the same clubs, as the Beatles. And it was cool. You know, Wow, it was great. And that's how I got my start. And we actually developed a following and, we went back again like a year and a half later, and they told us not to come, but I went anyway. It was snowing, freezing my ass off. They had a thing called the Eero Center, underground parking at night where all the hookers would go. And they're in like fishnets. It's 30 degrees, <laughs> you know? And we just wanted to walk down there and look around all the hot babes, and they talk, and I, we, no, no, we don't speak German. I speak English. No, no, we're just looking. <laughs> you know, we want to check it out, man. We're from America. You don't, you don't walk into a parking lot and there's all these women walking around. But it's a <laughs> shock coming out of California. We did those club runs, and that's how the whole thing kind of started. So I speak with a lot of, I will speak with musicians as well as actors, Don, and a lot of them are in the horror realm. So big Dream Warriors fan. I just have to ask yeah. you, uh, how did that opportunity come about for you? Well, it's great that, you know, if you look at this historically, that Nightmare on Elm Street 3 was the biggest of all. They made like seven of them. And Robert and I did an interview on a television show and we talked about it. But, you know, he'd had enough, you know. I mean, I mean, he, the, 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 what do you call it? It ran its course. Yeah. That was the only song ever that I've written that somebody told me how the chorus had to be. You have to put the lyrics, dream warriors in your chorus and i'm like okay so i asked the, the director was a fan of doc and that's all okay i said can you send me the script and he sent me a rough cut of the movie with the timeline going by it was a very rough edit and i and then i saw what the movie's about 
Freddie came to the kids in their dreams and he comes through the mattress and all that stuff. And that gave me the inspiration for writing the lyrics. And that was the end of it. And then we did the video. It was one of the first videos. I have a platinum video award on my wall. It was the first video that ever sold a million copies. Shit, I didn't know that. Oh, man, we made bank on that song. And then I was bummed when they did the repressing. They took our song off. Big mistake. Yeah. Well, they didn't want to to pay the royalty. Oh, yeah. I can remember just being a kid, rewinding the end of that VHS just to hear Dream Warriors at the end credits over and over. The very end credits, (laughs) right. And, at and, the they time, took, yeah. and they took it off. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's been, I've heard some stories floating around. So I'll just ask you while I got you that there are some, uh, there were some wild things going on that video shoot with you guys in Robert England. <laughs> no, that's all bullshit and fodder. It was no wild things going on, except we were all glued to Patricia Arquette. It was really cold because they had taken all the sets down from the house and the hell and all that and took all the sets down and moved them out to a warehouse out in Simi Valley where we shot. And it was like 40 degrees, you know, who would have known from that video in her first movie that she'd go on she got nominated for an Oscar. I think she got an Oscar. Was Robert on set as well? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Gotcha. Hell yeah. I mean, we, we shot for, you know, that was a long shoot, dude. I mean, it was cold. We're in a warehouse. I remember the director didn't think that maybe we should get fed. And I'm like, dude, we need, we're hungry, you know? So he sent out for like pizzas. <laughs> and uh, it took like, you know, two hours for Domino's to show up with cold pizzas because we're out in the warehouses. Warner Brothers has miles of warehouses with sets. And that kind of sucked. And I, me- I remember Robert's in his makeup and he had one piece here, one piece here. This like these prosthetics. And he was starving. <laughs> and he was trying to eat a pizza in between our shoots. And his face piece started falling off, the burnt face. Yeah. And I said, uh, Robert, your, your your face is falling off. He's like, what? I go, your face. And they put it while I'm a spirit gum. I go, you just want to let you know your face is falling off because <laughs> he was trying to chew. You know? <laughs> your face is falling off. And they're like, he's like, oh, shit. So they had to go fix it. But that was a tough shoot. You know, it was a lot of fun. And uh, it was really cold, you know, really, really cold. And that was it. Right. And there's this one scene where George breaks through a wall, you know, and there's Patricia and he breaks through playing the guitar and the solo. And the uh, carpenters screwed up. So George started to go through the wall, you know, roll. He comes to the wall and he just kind of hits it and it stopped. And the director goes, no, you got to really go for it. You know, and you see it in the video. He, has to, he had to really run through the wall as hard as he could because they put freaking two by fours or one by twos in there. And he had to literally crash through the wall because they screwed up. It wasn't, you know, fake. Usually they use like two by fours for framing a house, balsa woods. You just crash through it. So if you see the video, he's kind of crashing through. He gets stuck halfway. Then he pushed through the rest of the way. He was all cut up and bruised. And and the carpenter goes, oh, I'm sorry, man, my bad. Because he didn't know that the director was going to want him to crash through a wall. Right. But that was the only mishap that George had to crash through a real wall. (laughs) That was kind of funny. And Robert was there the whole time. We hung out and we actually became friends. I live in New Mexico now, Santa Fe. He has a house here in Santa Fe that he comes here in the winter and skis. And and I always wondered, like, you know, for years and years, like, because wh- I always thought when you're Freddy Krueger, you get, you get uh, stereotyped. And I thought, you know, he was a known actor before, but I thought, this is going to end his career, you know? Because he did like five of them, or you know. But when I met him, he was on Broadway. He's doing movies. He's doing great. No, he's still working. He's still working. He didn't get stereotyped, probably because he's now just Robert England, you know. Right. I've seen him in many movies. He's a very accomplished actor. Yeah, he is. We talked about that, and he said, "No, you know, luckily I was Freddie, 
<laughs> so I could be myself again and do Broadway and plays and movies and you know so but it like 30 years went forward to we did the Gibson TV interview with me and Robert so that was cool we just talked about New Mexico and what's going on in your life what's going on in your life you know we're all getting older <laughs> he's a great guy he's a really sweet guy so when you got approached about it were did, were you aware of the franchise at all yes I love horror movies. Mm. I mean, I, you know, and Halloween comes up. I love it when they play the original Frankenstein, the original Dracula, uh, the second, a werewolf. There was three werewolves. There's two Frank and three Frankensteins, Dracula. Uh, I found it sad when they made the movie with Johnny Depp about, the actor that played Dracula and he turned down, you've probably seen the movie, he turned down Frankenstein mm. as he was a real dramatic actor. And, uh, you know, he played Dracula and he said, I couldn't believe it that the guy that played, I can't remember his name, that played Frankenstein didn't even talk through the whole movie. Just, right. uh, 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 he didn't have to say a word, man. Just, uh, <laughs> That was his whole role. And that launched him into a famous actor. And he did a lot of Frankensteins and uh, Belly Lagosa. That was who played Dracula. As they did in the great movie that Johnny Depp did about at the end of his career, you know, he did that stupid movie called uh, Spaceship something number nine or something like yeah. that. Really bad. And he filmed the whole movie for like a couple thousand dollars. I can't remember what it was called. And it was sad that Bella was a heroin addict and he went out there. Everybody knows the story. It's Johnny Depp did the movie. Yeah. Junkie. And he loved Bella and, but then he died. And then, so you see the end of the movie, the guy that played it was always covered up with a cape on his face, you know, walking through the graveyard. It wasn't Bella Lugosi because he'd passed away. And that's a great movie. And Johnny Depp did it. It was a really great movie. It was sad to see how Bella lived in a little house in the valley and his career was over. He always said, I should have taken the Frankenstein role. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Don, while I got you, let's uh, talk about the new album that you got coming out on the 27th, Heaven Come. Good idea. Down. Yep. Gypsy's out now on YouTube, which is an animated video of the song Gypsy. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, I have. You know, I knew this was my last record, so I wanted everything to be over the top. And it took us two years to write it. And then I had my surgery, which is common knowledge on the internet, that my right arm is, as you can see, is paralyzed. I have a really horrible looking hand. It's the whole arm's paralyzed. Fucking doctor. So I can't play guitar. I can't play bass. I can't play piano anymore. So I can't make music. So I said, guys, thank God I'd written 30 songs before that. And we had all this music in my catalog and we just kind of picked the best and made Heaven Comes Down. And uh, I will stick to my guns that we got lightning in a bottle. Oh, dude, obviously, you know, every actor, every musician, new album, new movie, it's the best, it's the greatest. Blah, blah, blah. But you know, even if it's shit, but the truth is, it's a great album. Right. Every song on Heaven Comes Down is good. You know, we wrote 25 songs, recorded 14 of the best, and the label said they only wanted 10. And I said, well, that makes no sense. Metallica did load and reload. They had 15 songs, but the label didn't want any more than 10 because we're putting it out on vinyl because it's having a huge comeback vinyl. Yeah. So, so if they would have put out 10 on the vinyl and 15 on the CD, we would have been competing with ourselves. So they took four, four songs off. I was pretty bummed and they were really good. So, and there were me playing guitar and bass. So I was kind of bummed about that, but maybe they'll come out on a special edition collector's edition sometime. We've already done like 20 shows. I'm only off for like eight days and I'm going back out. Wisconsin. Uh, you just got to go dock and dot net. There's like, we have like eight or nine more shows. And 
all the way through November. And I just got back three days ago. We had like 7,000 people at the Big E in Massachusetts. There was a lot of people there. And that was cool, you know? So we're on tour. But right now I'm concentrating on going to Europe and Japan mm. because we have a lot of fans. There was a point in time, maybe 85, that we were bigger than Bon Jovi in Japan. I mean, we were we were really big. We'd sell out arenas everywhere. Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, Yokohama. I mean, we were a big band. So we haven't gone there in seven years since I did the Dockham Reunion. But we're on tour right now in the U.S., winding down eight shows. It's really weird, this tour in 2023, that it seems like our audience is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There's a whole new generation of fans. They're like in their early 20s. And I do these, you have these things now called meet and greets. Mm -hmm. So I ask them, how do you know about Doc? And you weren't born yet. And they're like, well, my parents gave me all their records and CDs and cassettes. <laughs> so these kids got turned on to Doc and at 10, 12, 15, but they couldn't go to the shows. Right. They're too young. So now they're in their 20s. They're like, oh man, I love those Doc. I'm going to go see Doc. And <laughs> so we have a whole new audience of kids in their 20s. I look out in the audience and I see people in their 40s and 50s and 60s. It's a very eclectic audience we have. Right. We have 6,000 people four days ago in Massachusetts. Shit. So that's been interesting to see all these young people when I meet them. And I say, because I see them singing the lyrics, Into the Fire, Breaking the Chains, In My Dream, Alone Again. I'm like, dude, you weren't born. <laughs> and they go, we got turned on, we got turned on a dock and via our parents. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And I know you just mentioned, Don, that, you know, they fucked your arm up and you can't play music anymore. But once yeah, this, they, do you plan to uh, tour in the future at all as, after this is wrapped up? Or is this your last tour yes, as well? Yes. We'll keep touring. I, and I've done like a lot of interviews. Be it Spain, Italy, Poland, Russia, Germany. I've been doing interviews when I'm off the road. And I tell them this is our last record. And that's true. But we're not going to stop touring. You know, I mean, there's nothing I can do. You know, right. I'm hoping the surgeon that screwed my life up will get ran over by a bus. That'd you know, nice. he was supposed to be the top surgeon at Cedar sinai And uh, he really, he really screwed me up. My whole arm took a, it took a year for me to be able to, to raise my hand above my head. Shit, man. A year, but you can see it's just skin and bone and you just severed like, I'm not talking about a nerve. I'm talking about thousands. So, he, you know, I was depressed, obviously. You know, I came home, I was in a walker, you know, I'm in a cane and yeah, it sucked, man. But the bottom line is I would love to keep going as Doc, but I can't write any more songs. Right. It's I'm screwed. I took my Steinway piano and shipped it to Los Angeles because my daughter is a concert trained pianist. She was happy to get that. But I don't know how I can write another record. I was talking to John Lem the other day. I said, You want if this album is successful, you want to do another one? And he said, I don't know if I have it in me. Mm. So you know, I'm the writer, I'm the singer, just like I wasn't docking, you know, I'm not throwing my old guys under the bus, but I was the main writer. Right. I wrote the hits in my dreams and it's not love and alone again, and Hunter, even though when you look at the record credits and it says Don Dock and George Lynch, Jeff Pilson, Mick Brown, they didn't write those songs. And everybody knows in my camp that I wrote the songs. Right. You know, the, the guitar and the lyrics. Those other three guys were in Orange County with an ounce of cocaine trying to come up with some good songs. <laughs> and that's why I couldn't write with them because I don't do I don't do drugs. Never right. did. It was the 80s, man. Like the old saying goes, if you were at the Rainbow or the Whiskey or on the Sunset Strip, chances are the cocaine you bought came from Carlos Escobar. <laughs> you know, he was the main dealer. The right. only thing I learned when I knew I could look at cocaine with my friends doing it. I could say, that's good cocaine. You're snorting toothpaste. 
know? I'm like, why is that Coke all gooey and looks weird? I take my finger and I'd lick it and go, that's not Coke. Are you sure that's Coke? Because I tried Coke. I tried Coke and like when I was 21, 22. You know, you take a little on your tongue and your whole face would go numb, you know? Yeah. The cool thing about Coke was, if I say something cool about it, is you could have sex for hours and go to bed and go to sleep. Real pure cocaine. You were making a love to your old lady and just going for it. But then again, I was young and you could go to sleep. And then I, you know, fast forward and we get famous and everybody's all amped and sweating. And I'm like, I don't know if that's cocaine, man. It's probably because they start putting meth in it and crystal meth oh, and shit. Dude. Yeah. I'm like, dude, that's not the real deal, man. I, I saw the real deal, the real <laughs> stuff, like the dentist do, you know, <laughs> right. put it in your tongue, no face goes numb. <laughs> so, but that, those days are gone. And now cocaine is passe. You know, the new drug of choice is fentanyl. Yeah, fentanyl, yeah. I got a, we got a big problem in New Mexico because it's going over the border. And I think it's, we're averaging about 150 deaths a day right now in New Mexico. Jesus. Because they have those presses and they make, the pills and it mm. looks like it's pharmaceutical and it says 10 milligrams which you can handle but it could be 150 milligrams and they're Jeez. making it in trailers so people take a pill or smoke it and they die they overdose yeah the it's patches worse. the patches are a problem too because people cut them open and they're supposed to be delayed release and then they get it all at once and instantly die yep i met people like that i got kind of hooked on patches when i had some back problems and these girls in the rehab said, yeah, we take the patches and we just cut them and just squeeze all the stuff into our mouth all at Ooh. once. Like, so you're getting like a three day patch all at once. Holy Not shit. <laughs> no, the fentanyl patches, you know, they're like everybody. If you're a addicted person, you abuse it, you know? Yeah. I'm on the road. And I, I, I recognize people that are jacked up. Right. And it's very sad, you know? It's a crisis in America. And, you know, the government's like, fentanyl is a crisis, blah, blah, blah. What are you doing about it? Jack shit. This is another question I like to ask everybody. Have you ever had an experience you'd consider supernatural or paranormal? Supernatural or paranormal? No, I don't think so. Okay. I remember I dropped acid when I was 14 for the first time. I lived in Lake Tahoe. And I felt guilty afterwards. My brother was like 17 months younger than me, Rick. And I slipped him a hit of acid, but that's when acid was acid. You know, we're talking about the Woodstock days and San Francisco was only two hours away from Lake Tahoe. And I took a horde. Everybody knows the name orange sunshine. So I took some orange sunshine, gave some to him. And we went down to the beach, this beautiful, huge lake in Lake Tahoe. And, you know, living up there in those days was like being Opie, you know, <laughs> it was like, really, I'm like, where, where's the sheriff? You know, we didn't have gangs and drugs and everybody's just a pot, you know, and acid. It was 19, whatever it was. I can't remember, 66, 7. Uh, and we took acid and we just sat on the beach for about four hours and it was pure. And you talk about supernatural. I wouldn't say supernatural, but I'd say it was more of a spiritual mm. experience. Looking yeah. at over the water. And, you know, and you, of course, you can if everybody, you do your hand, you get the traces, you know, all that shit. And all the colors, you know, red was real red and blue was real blue. And <laughs> everything was all uh, expounded, you know. And I think it's a shame the government uh, took, made LSD a Schedule One drug and made it illegal. I mean, it helped so many people thousands and thousands of people coming back from Vietnam with PTSD and schizophrenia and depression, suicidal. They did thousands of studies that LSD helped people quit drinking yeah. and quit doing this. And they weren't suicidal. It was a good drug. That's my opinion. And I'll stick to it. And you do it in a setting where, you know, the problem with the people freaking out and, you know, going nuts because it was cut was something yeah yeah it wasn't just lsd it was like speed or some other shit in it mm -hmm. but pure lsd 25 
I still stick to it. If you watch Vice TV, there's a whole uh, show on these old men now that were professors and said LSD was a great drug for helping people with suicidal tendencies, drug addiction, alcoholism. You know, it had its properties, but you got these old geezers in Congress. You know, look, marijuana in 40 states is still considered deadly. Yeah. I've never heard anybody dying on pot. You're going to die on smoking a joint? <laughs> It'd but, be a way, you know, have a way to go. <laughs> yeah, but go look at the Congress. These guys are 80. They're senile. They can't even talk. I mean, if you want to do a new series of the Crypt TV, you could put Biden in there. <laughs> well, Don, I'm about to let you go, man. Just to put a bow here, just what's on the horizon for you? What can you tell folks that's coming up? I'm just going on the tour. I'm leaving again in about a week and a half, going back out, wrap up the last eight shows. And then we thought for shits and giggles, we'd end our tour at the Whiskey. You know, it's too small for us, you know, but that's where I started with playing with Van Halen, Quiet Riot. I mean, that's where I got my start. It's fitting. And I said I'd never play there again. It's just too small. And they always jacked it. But we're going to end our tour in L.A., where I started. So, you know, in 1976, I was 22 or three. Don't remember. I was young and I had this dream. You talk about what you want to do. And I had this dream. I tell the guys, someday we're going to headline the whiskey and sell it out. <laughs> 650 people. Eight years later, we're playing stadiums with Van Halen, Scorpions, Metallica, and Eddie Van Halen and I would sit after the show at night in the hotel and talk about that. And I say, Eddie, I played with you at the Whiskey. Who would have thought that you fast forward only 10 years and we're playing stadiums? And Eddie's like, dude, I never thought it would happen. <laughs> so Eddie and I would just sit there and talk about, you know, how in the hell do we get from there to sold out 120,000 people. It was pretty right. wild. You know, I mean, I went there in those days and saw Metallica playing the Troubadour for 400 people. And I remember my manager, Cliff Bernstein, he was also there and he said, this band's going to be huge. And he was right. They're the biggest band in the world now. Yeah, to say the least. <laughs> I saw him play at a little club for 400 people. And he said, they're going to, they're going to be huge. And when I saw Metallica, they actually opened for us. And I called my manager and I said, I know we might be more famous right now. And we're making twice their money. Could you could put them on after us? <laughs> you know, no, I, I said, I go, can you put them on? You're the man. Can you put Metallica on after us? How do I compete when they end their show with Kill Em All or you know, all those songs? And then we, we come on stage and we're doing In My Dreams or something or it's not love. I mean, we look like the monkeys, you know, <laughs> because Metallica was so fucking ballsy. Yeah. You know, tell the boys, George, Jeff and Mick, look, look at Metallica. They go on stage every day and they are like a war machine. They are in it deep. They push themselves to the limit. Yeah. And we like done a world tour and we got kind of complacent. Hey, we're famous. We're rock stars. You know, we're all millionaires now, you know, and I, I don't think we were good at monsters, but warming up for Metallica was tough, you know, and now they are the biggest. They can play anywhere they want. Look, they just played the Antarctic. <laughs> yeah, they did. I mean, what was that all about? <laughs> They're like, have we, have we, is there any place on this planet we haven't played? Yeah, the Antarctic. Oh, fuck it. Let's go to the Antarctic. <laughs> and we came in this big dome. And they're all bundled up and they're playing in the Antarctic for the goddamn Eskimos. <laughs> I thought, how cool is that? That it's they cool. said we want to play every place in the planet. Right. And they're all billionaires and they've sold hundreds of millions of records. So we were on that path, you know, to become in superstars. But at the end of Monsters of Rock, you know, with the drugs and the fighting and me and George arguing, we failed. And that and the rest is history. I'm oh. grateful at my age to still be out there kicking ass for six and seven thousand people. Right. Seven years old. There's nothing to I, shake your head at. I was talking to Robert Halford about that, and he's like, Isn't this great? 
you know, we can still go out and play for thousands of people after 50 years of my dude. I am totally grateful. I have no complaints and God bless the Dawkins fans. Yeah. How old are you now, Don? 70? 60? 70. So Just like tr- uh, June 29th, two months ago, I turned 70. And I told the band I'm retiring at 70. That's because what happened to my arm and all that. But, you know, I miss, I like to play. I want to sing. It's a rush. Yeah. We have our standard line about touring. It's 22 hours of hell for two hours of glory. Mm. <laughs> Airplanes stuck in Dallas for five hours. Planes cancel. You're stuck overnight. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah. The days of tour buses. I love that. You walk off stage, go to the bus, get in my bunk, put in my buds. And I used to like uh, ebooks because I have to read it. Yeah. Just put my earphone and just the guy would narrate the book. And those were great days. I tell the driver, wake me up when we're in the next city. <laughs> I loved it. But now you got to fly everywhere. Yeah. And you, you spend your whole life. I spend more time in the airport than anywhere. And I hate it. John texted me just this morning. He said, dude, it took him 14 hours to get home. Gosh. Two aborted landings. Weather. You know what's on the news. Hurricanes, storms, floods. I don't know where you're at, but the East Coast is getting their ass kicked. Yeah, I'm in South Carolina. Oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Carolina got hammered, man. Yeah. Hammered. <laughs> See the cars floating down the street. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit. This is something I should write a lyric about. And <laughs> yeah. that's kind of what we did. The album's called Heaven Comes Down because the world's going to hell in a handbasket bus. I'm glad I lived in the 70s and 80s. You're young. You got a long life ahead of you. I tell my kids, I don't welcome you guys to the future. So this is our last record. All the songs are stories. I didn't write any songs about love found, love lost, all my typical writing style. Yeah. And it is what it is. It's a great record. and But, you know, we can tour until I fall down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look at the Stones. They just put out that cool new video where they're jumping off the billboard. Dude, they're in their 80s. Yeah, still rocking it. And the Stones are still kicking ass. Right. They've only lost one. They've only lost Charlie, passed away. I think the bass player did too. Can't remember. You know, but I know that Charlie died, Watts, but they're still touring. Yeah, man. And it ain't about money. It ain't about fame. You know, they, Mick they don't Jagger, need either one of those. No, Mick Jagger's a superstar. You don't need shit. <laughs> Castle in England. And I know why he does it. Because he's fit because he loves to be on stage and feel that spiritual rush of all those people with their fists in the air singing along. I get it as a singer. It's a mm-hmm. spiritual thing. It's the forget about heroin, fentanyl, cocaine. To be on stage, all those people sending all that energy toward you. It's the biggest high on the planet. There's nothing better. I can imagine. Well, Don, I'm about to let you get out of here, man. I kind of kept you over right. here. It's okay. I can go pull some weeds. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Don, you take it easy, man. It's been great talking. Take care, to you. boss. Good luck with your career.